continuing the theme from last week, uh, dealing with the Kohen and his various uh, various restrictions and various privileges and opportunities. So it's important to understand something about the Kohen and the, the role of the Kohen, and that the Kohen, you know, the, the Judaism is the is the great uh, equalizer. You know, Judaism would never advocate for a tyrannical approach. There's no such thing as an authoritarian religious Jewish leader, and if he is an authorita- uh, authoritarian, he's not he's not religious. It's a contradiction, right? Because if you're even if you're the king of the Jewish people, even if you're King David, and you could be King David, King Solomon, the greatest kings that we ever had, yet they cannot do the most important, most privileged, the most spiritually significant service that is known to the entire Jewish people. The king cannot do it. No matter what he wanted, no matter how hard he wanted to do it, he cannot do it. That is only the province of the high priest, the Kohen Gadol, who gets to go into the Holy of Holies in the temple on Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year. He gets to go to the holiest place on the holiest day of the year. So it's the holiest, uh, holiest moment in space and time. And he gets to atone for the holiest people, the Jewish people, the entire Jewish people on Yom Kippur in the Holy of Holies. The king cannot do that. He's the king. He's the leader of the, of the Jewish people. No, nope, he cannot go in. Only the high priest is able to achieve this kind of level of purity. So the Kohen has an incredible high level of sanctity and responsibilities. However, he cannot do things the king can do. He cannot call a war for the sake of the Almighty. Only the king can do that. So there's a checks and a beautiful checks and balance system that exists within the Jewish people. Okay. There's a uh, there was a great rabbi, you know, only in Israel. You know, speaking of a tragedy in Israel, let's speak of a beautiful spiritual phenomenon in Israel. That in Israel, you know, when, when I was in yeshiva, so when I was in yeshiva called the Mir Yeshiva, I took some of the guys in the Jeddah Bar uh, P trip to the Mir Yeshiva. The Mir Yeshiva is in the is near uh, Mea Sha'arim, right, and like like a little bit close to the old city, and when you live in the mirror, when you were learning the mirror yeshiva, so I dormed in this, I won't even describe the living conditions because I think it would shock all of you, but I used to live in a place in Mea Sha'arim, in a dorm in Mea Sha'arim, and it was between the mirror and this place called Bate Ungaren, which literally means the Hungarian houses. And it's like, it's like, it's like a snapshot of literally Fiddler on the Roof. Like, like they don't, you know, there's no mail. There's like, no, I don't think they have mail. It's like literally from the from the 18th century. And you see these men walking around and like someone's pushing a wheelbarrow, someone's pushing a cart. And I remember I was once walking with a buddy of mine and, and a rabbi, he's like, oh, that, yeah. He knows all of the Talmud by heart. Oh yeah, that guy, yeah. He's like a Kabbalist that, you know, knows everything. You know, in, in Jerusalem, you'll find the most common looking people doing the most mundane things, but they're incredibly great scholars. So there was a fellow named, I think he passed away in the 70s, Rav Moshe Chalban. Moshe Chalban. Now, Chalban is a familiar word. It comes to the word chalav, which means milk. And he was called the Chalban because he was a milkman. That was actually his job. He delivered the milk. And eventually, uh, after many, many years, when he was already very, very old and still delivering milk, it became known that he was an incredible Torah scholar. He knew... Uh, he knew mysticism and he knew the Talmud by heart. And he ended up, uh, they ended up publishing his works. I don't know if it, while he was alive or posthumously, but he, they, many of his works were uh, found, unearthed, and recorded. Let me just get rid of whatever this binging is. There it is. Apologize. And they found it. So he writes the following, this Rabbi Moshe Chalban. He said, we all kind of look at the Kohen, and this will burst Mike's bubble, um, and Danielle, this will now give you allowance to have Mike uh, take the garbage out and not use the Kohanic excuse. Although I, I, as a, as, although I give rabbinic permission for Mike to continue using the Kohanic excuse so that he doesn't take out the garbage. Yes, 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 I agree. But the Rabbi Moshe Chalban says a very interesting thing. He says, we associate the Kohen as like this, as having this like unique gene, which is only, only, you know, there is a, there is a, a Kohen gene. I discussed this with uh, 
with a few people. There is a gene that they've identified that is specific to the Kohen, to the Kohanic line. But the Rav Moshe Chaban says that it's not that he's intrinsically holy, like his soul is not built or any bigger or, or more connected or more, more pure than yours and mine. Rather, the Kohen and the line of Kohanim is meant to be serving as an example. He calls it, says it, he says, Dugma. It is meant to be as merely like a representation, an example of what a Jew should look like or should aspire to be. Now, the Kohen serves God and serves at the pleasure of the Jewish people because he's a Kohen. But a Jew, a regular Jew like me, should look at the Kohen and say, wow. This Kohen can get that close to God, and on, and on Yom Kippur, the high priest can get as close to God as anyone possibly can. I, little old me, want to be like that as well. That's an incredible lesson, that the purpose of a Kohen is not that he himself has some intrinsic holiness that you and I can never possess. It's that he has the job of representing something He's aspirational. We should want to be like him so that we can do things that he does, which is an amazing thing. The whole purpose of a coin is meant to be, is, is like, a, is like a, a, a lamppost that the Almighty sticks in to the fiber of humanity in order to give us like, uh, to give us inspiration, motivation, to give us aspirational uh, representation. That's a pretty amazing thing. It's to give a Jew a sense of mindfulness that when I see the Kohen, I want to think that I can be like, like that. It's to reframe. Yes, except for the whole Philadelphia Flyers thing, which is an unfortunate, which is an unfortunate sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, perversion of the Kohanic gene. But you know, whatever. Not not, not everyone's perfect. To give us a life of mindfulness, and the point is that when you think, hey, I see the coin, you think I can be like that and I can do the things that he does. Not realistically, you cannot bring sacrifices to the temple if you're not a coin. That's just the rule that Hashem, that the Almighty placed upon the Jewish people. But I can be on that level, on that spiritual level. It's very simple. So therefore, you hang out with people who should re represent the ultimate in the best way of living for you. Right? You want to be you want to be an Olympian? Guess what? You hang out with an Olympian, right? Uh, I, I just saw a week ago. So we had a, I don't know. It was at the beginning of Corona. We had the this woman BD Deutsch. Everyone remember? So BD Deutsch is an Orthodox American woman. She lives in Beit Shemesh in Israel, and she's, I mean, she's an Olympian. I mean, that's basically it. She basically she she had, she a few years ago she couldn't compete because the trials for the Olymp to to be in the, to to for her for track and field for the running that she was going for was on Shabbos and she didn't do that so she missed on that Olympics, but she's basically they redid things in Israel to accommodate her and the religious athletes, and she's an Olympic level runner, um, and it's pretty incredible. And I just saw amazingly I don't know if you all saw this that Adidas hired her as a spokesperson. She has a, uh, she has a, she has a shoe deal with Adidas. See, you don't have to be some guy who can, uh, you know, jump, uh, you know, be seven feet tall and dunk. You can be a five foot two Orthodox woman wearing a techel or a shaitol and running. You just have to run like five miles, you know, 500 miles in like 30 seconds or something horrible like that. But you can also get an Adidas uh, contract. And the tagline for her, the ads are, are amazing. It's like some say my belief uh, sets me back. I say that orthodoxy pushes me forward. Something like that. It's wonderful. I think it's the greatest thing in the world. I'm sure there's some people harumphing and, you know, poo-pooing it. But I think it's fantastic. But she, hang, but now, you know, she has a coach, like a real Olymp Olympian-style coach, and she's training like a mad woman. Right? These things, if you want to aspire to be something – it's very natural that the only way to do that is to hang around like-minded people and you learn by osmosis. You know, one of the, one of the most important things I think I, tr I try to do this, I haven't done this, I didn't do this last year. I did it the year before. I did, I did not do it the year before that, but the year before that I did do that. I did do it is because is, uh, I'll give you a very good example that I tried to incorporate in my life. You can think of your own. On Purim, right? Purim is a very, Purim is a very, heck, a very interesting day. It's, it's, it's funny enough, I find it to be the most hectic and busiest 
and probably the most stressful Jewish holiday, more than Pesach. I don't know about you. I actually find Purim more stressful than Pesach many years. Okay? Because if you're like my wife, and if you're married to Freddie Mandel, that means that your Mishloch Manot theme is like, is like, is like planned out with like the poem and the packaging and the has to this. So I, I, I used to argue, and then after like five years into marriage, I realized like this is how it's going to be until, you know, until we're just like we're living in our kids' basements as at 119 years old, 120, and I should just stop arguing. And so every year, like we ha- we do this, it's like my wife's creativity, and it's for a mitzvah, so I, I can't say it's wrong. It's beautiful, and my kids really get into the holiday more because they're involved in the planning and the execution, the packaging, et cetera, et cetera. So with all the busyness of perm, the mishloch manot, and then you have to like, you know, plot out your roots, and then that's besides the shul, of course, and, you know, you have to go to your kids, teachers south, and then north, and then and then you have to, like, create a whole route. And if it's Friday, like, well, this year, we're like, forget it. And then, of course, you have to get back. And then you, Megillah, Megillah, Davening, you know, Mishloch, Manot. Then you have to prepare for your meal. And you have to do all these things in, like, you know, an impossible time frame. But one thing I really, really tried to do, and I've done this a number of years, is that on Purim, on, on, after, on Purim, post-Purim, right, when Purim goes into the evening, um, after this, the meal, so I, I, you have to be a little brave to do this. I take my boys to the yeshiva, to near Israel. Now, I don't recommend this for the faint of heart because the scene in the yeshiva, okay, take your biggest frat party or sorority party in university and now like times it by 3,000 and that's what the yeshiva looks like. It's, but it's an incredible scene David, it's a crime scene. Well, the next morning it's a crime scene. Yes, I, I would agree. It's pretty fantastic. I think it's incredible. But anyway, what I do is that I go, I take my my boys, I, I I go very quickly. I make sure they don't see or like we don't get distracted by any unruly sights. And we go into the Beit Beit Midrash, the main study hall, and there's always this scene, and it's and it's and it's and it's and it's really yes, your level of drinking. That was a private message. I won't say who asked me that. Um, but there's always this scene. Rabbi Meyerfeld, who is the senior Rosh Hashiva, who, 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 who normally is a very, he's very nice and he's very funny and he's brilliant, but he's quite intimidating. If anyone has ever spoken to him and you say that he's not intimidating, I don't, you're lying. He's, he's got serious presence. Like, he, he, you know, he's just very intimidating. And I was, I was in Yeshiva when he wasn't even the Rosh Hashiva yet. And I, I found him intimidating then. I still find him intimidating. And again, he's great, and I get along with him, and he, he loves our shul. And, but he's just an intimidating big Rosh Hashiva with a big beard, a big long coat, a big hat, and a brilliant Torah scholar. But on Purim night, he's sitting there in a chair. There's like 30 yeshiva boys around him, and they're crying. And they're like literally bawling like babies, and they're begging him for blessings and they're like pulling at his beard and they're saying, Rebbe, help me be the greatest I can be. And it's an amazing scene. It's like really, it's like you have teenagers, teenage boys, you know, teenage boys, when they get, first of all, they wouldn't be in yeshiva normally, but if they were drunk, they wouldn't be looking for the wise man to give them blessing and to give them guidance in life and how to be a better person. And there's like 30 boys, like all over him. And every year I basically have to like kind of punch through I put my son in front of Rabbi Mirapal. I say, Rabbi, please give him a bracha. And he gives him a blessing on his head. And then I, I, I quickly I quickly vacate. I, I exit stage left very quickly. Because I know that this is what they'll remember about Purim, the fun, the costume, the, 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 you know, this, the meal. But they will remember going to the wise men and seeing that that is the, really the ultimate of Judaism. I want to be like him. That's aspirational. That's an example of a teacher. The point here is that we should see what we can be. I cannot be mediocre. Rabbi Wormer always used to say, mediocrity is a sin. And mediocrity is not a Jewish word. It just, it's not. You know, how, you know how personally overrated in my opinion, I'm sure that's a heresy for some here, but Wayne Gretzky, you know, everyone knows how he became great. He said, I never played the puck where it was. I always looked where it was going to be. Right, and that's how all the great athletes played. Michael Jordan, right? He always saw the game three steps ahead. 
There's a great quote by Abraham Lincoln, one of my favorite historical characters. And Lincoln said, at the end of my life, you know, my whole life right now is lived, I'm paraphrasing, I don't remember the exact wording, is that I must live in order that this world will be better for my having been in it. And if I can't say that at the end of my life, it will have been a life not worth living, right? Lincoln really was a great man. He really was. And he envisioned himself changing humanity in some way, which he really did. And since he envisioned himself at point A in the future doing something great, he got there. Because if you truly aspire to it, then you can get there. This is the point of the Kohen. And this is why we're learning about the Kohen. And this is why, by the way, the Kohen and the whole book of Leviticus, the book of Vayikra, the book of Leviticus, is the central book of the five books in the Torah. And the rabbis actually say, two books at the beginning of the Torah, Genesis and Exodus, two books at the end, Numbers and Deuteronomy, Bamibar and Devarim, and one book in the middle. They call that's how that's that, that's their phraseology. They tell us that this book, which is the book of Leviticus, which is all about you know spiritual disease called Sarat, all this, the laws of the sacrifices, laws of ritual and spiritual impurity by the Kohen, very, very arcane, difficult, complex laws. In fact, most of the mitzvot in the book of Leviticus are not relevant to us nowadays anymore, anyway because we don't have a temple. Yet it's central. And it's central, I think, because it tells us how to centrally be a Jew, which is you, have, you aspire to be great. You can be great. How do you do that? You find people who represent some area of greatness and you try to be like them. Very simple. Okay? That's really the name of the game. That's what, and that is best represented, okay, to the extreme degree, not by the king, but by the Kohen, I would argue, because the Kohen can do the most extremely holy thing in the, in the entire uh, cycle of human events, which is go to the Holy of Holies, talk to God, and he can do the most important thing, which is what? Seek atonement, forgiveness. Forgiveness is the most powerful thing for the Jewish people. Okay, so this point of being aspirational, of looking for something in the future to a place you can get. I sent this uh, a number of weeks back before the lockdown to a, a small group of women. Um, I think who was there? Maybe Shauna and Alona. Maybe you heard you. I think you heard this already, but I'm going to repeat it here because it's it's a powerful, powerful word. It's a powerful word. Um, Someone called me and said, listen, you know, maybe you can share some words of wisdom with us. We're having a hard time. The lockdown, the kids, the at home, this school, no school, yes school, this restriction, you know, when the vaccine is, isn't, when, you know, the website, York, York Region website was impossible, now it's possible. Oh, it opened up. Oh, it didn't open up. Right, we're losing our minds. Can you give us some inspiration? So I said, yeah, sure. Thank you for asking. I'll try. I hung up and I'm like thinking, like, what, what at this point, right, what at this point can I say? Like, what am I going to say at this point that will actually help anyone? Oh, it'll get better. Like, yeah, it will, but it kind of sucks right now. Let's be honest. Oh, it'll help. You know, we have to appreciate what we have. Like, you know, you've heard that before. You know, I don't think anybody is so interested in that tagline anymore. It could be I'm just very, uh, you know, jaded and prejudiced by now. So, and maybe I'm imposing my emotions upon you. And and my beard's really, really been itching me today. So it's made me, it made me cranky. Okay. Like, what am I going to, I was thinking, like, what am I going to say to them? Oh, you know, but now that your children are home more, you appreciate them all the much more. Bull, beep. You want your kids in school. You can't really appreciate them. Someone's messaged me. We spent a year appreciating them. Yes, yes. We were appreciating them so much that you appreciate the school even more. Like, there's nothing. I was like, what? What can I possibly say to to give us boost? So, when I want to aspire for wisdom, and I really am out of ideas, which happens quite often, all the time, I turn to someone who I wish to be like. So I called. I called Rabbi Lowy who I've mentioned many times, who, you know, thank God I have a relationship now, a very good relationship with. And Rabbi Lowy is, again, I, I think everyone knows by now, but he's the rabbi of the Agudah Shul, the Agudah Yisrael Shul, on Bathurst and Wilson by Carmichael. 
And he's again, he's just a, a, an incredible, uh, he's at this point, the world renowned, incredible sage, incredible scholar, uh, a great halachic decider. But, but more than that, he, he's incredibly insight, he's incredibly insightful, incisive, and he's very sensitive. He's a very sensitive, like a very deeply sensitive, warm person, incredible advisor. You know, he's the guy who, like, if, when everything goes wrong, like you call him, and he, he basically is able to make it right with his advice. So I called him and I said, listen, Rebbe, there's a bunch of people that want some chizuk, they want some words of inspiration, and I don't really have much to offer at this point. Uh, can you give me something? So right away, with, without thinking, that's also what happens. He doesn't usually, I don't really see him thinking much when he talks to me. Oh, Mike, that's just awful. I will give you Mike's comment that he messaged me directly. Rabbi Lowy will always give me the low down. Oh, it's so painful. As I said, there are certain Kohanim that you should not aspire to be like, or certain Kohanic qualities that you should not aspire to be like. We accept your apologies, uh, Danielle. Thank you. So Rabbi Lowy said the following, and this was this is incredible. I shared this with a few of the women here. I don't remember exactly who, but it's it's worth hearing again. And I'm telling you, when I heard this, it really it, it flipped around my whole perspective of the past year of the of the of the pandemic. And it gave me an incredible new insight. It's a very simple shift. It's a very simple paradigm shift. But please pay attention because it, it helped me tremendously. And I think, and I, and I suggest that it can help you too. The Parsha, when I asked him this, was Parsha Shmini, which was uh, one, two, three weeks ago. Okay? And so Rabbi Lowy said, well, this week is Parsha Shmini. And Parsha Shmini talks about the day that the tabernacle, the portable temple that was in the desert, was erected finally, and it was built and put up on the first day of the Hebrew month of Nisan, right, which is 14 days before Passover begins. And Rabbi Lowy said the Kohanim for seven days prior to that were inducted into the service of that they were about to embark on for gener forever, and they were given the rules and the instructions on the eighth day, which was the first month of Nisan again. They were formally inducted by Moses, who was the brother of Aaron, who was the leader, the high priest. And Moses poured the anointing oil on them, and then he, he inducted them, and he gave them their charge. And he, right? And if you look at the Parsha, it says all this very clearly. However, what we have to remember is that for the seven days prior to that, the Kohanim went into isolation because they were, for, they were concerned that they would become spiritually impure, and if they're spiritually impure, they cannot bring the sacrifices, they cannot serve in the tabernacle. So Rabbi Lowy said the Kohanim, not only were they being told the rules, they were in and were being uh, inducted for a seven-day indu induction uh, ceremony, co uh, culminating in the final day, but they were isolated and removed from removed from the rest of the Jewish people. So Rabbi Lowy said that this has always been the pattern of, Ju of, of, of Jewish history. Whenever the Jews have been forced into hiding, right, Either they've been forced into hiding through persecution, pogroms, or even a pandemic. When Jews have to be hidden and put down or go into their homes and removed from their normal societal way of operating Judaism, that always gives birth to the greatest glory the Jewish people have ever known. And what happened on the first of the tabernacle? The Mishkan was, erased, was, was raised. And this, one could argue was the greatest day of the Jewish people's existence, even greater than Mount Sinai. Because at Mount Sinai, the Almighty spoke to the Jewish people, we know. He said the first two commandments, but then he had to back off because the Jewish people couldn't handle it and Moses took over. So the Almighty said the first two commandments. He kind of had to retire to the back wing. Moses took over, and then he proceeded to say the last eight commandments. But the tabernacle was the first time in history that there was a physical place where the Almighty's presence can come down and manifest itself to the Jewish people on a permanent basis. This was then a greater day and a greater celebration and a more radical and greater accomplishment for the entire Jewish people's history and future than even Sinai was in a sense. And so the greatest day, the greatest celebration and joy of the Jewish people's history and existence was the first of the month of Nisan, the eighth day when the tabernacle was put up and it was preceded by a period of isolation. Yeah. Now, all we, of course, we know what happened 
what, what other event happened on, on the uh, on the on the first of Nisan is that Aaron's two sons passed away in a horrific way. But besides that, you know, and that was also ended up becoming a great moment in Jewish history. It was the moment that taught us about sanctifying God's name, which we spoke about last week, right? <clears throat> so the greatest glory, to quote Rabbi Lowy, the greatest glory of the Jewish people is preceded by quiet moments when you have to go into hiding, when you're forced into isolation. Look at Soviet Jewry, right? And uh, the most contemporary example, e the, uh, easy contemporary example, the Jewish people in Russia, in, in the USSR, who were literally, they had to light Shabbos candles in their cellar, you know, and if they were caught, they were killed by the KGB, right? So those Jews, once the Iron Curtain fell, the explosion of Judaism that came out of Russia, we couldn't keep up, right? I mean, I, I was, you know, it was before my time, but I, I know stories of, 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 you know, Rabbi Weimer would fly to Moscow like once a month, and he would just give class after class after class, right? Rabbi, he Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Heinemann, who was one of the greatest rabbis in uh, America, the head of the founder and head of the Star K Kashrut Agency, is a genius, an incredible, brilliant Torah scholar. He was very involved in teaching Soviet Jews after the, the curtain fell. And he used to go with Tefillin. He used to, sorry, he used to go for, with Tefillin before the curtain fell, right? And he, he remembers he would bring four pairs of Tefillin and the Soviet agents would say, we, uh, what, you're, you're, there's two of you. And Rabbi Heinemann would say, oh, well, one's for me for the week, one's for me on Shabbat, that one's for my wife for the week, and that one's for my wife on Shabbat. And they would say, oh, okay. He would bring, and he would manage to get three pairs of tefillin into the country and give to Jews who needed it, right? And he said after the curtain fell, he couldn't, they, couldn't, they couldn't send tefillin over fast enough. Right? The explosion of Jewish literacy and Jewish uh, um, 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 pride and Jewish um, acceleration in, in Soviet Russia was incredible. And of course, the most stark example, which we still can't fathom, but the greatest renaissance the Jewish people have ever experienced, okay, and this is not a fantastical claim, this is a claim that's really based on statistics and reality, right? After the worst years of our history, right, from, 30, from 1938 to 1945, were the worst years of the Jewish people's history, in my opinion. But, and of course, this is not me to say that we wished it would have happened, and it doesn't justify anything, but the fact of the matter is that after 45, from 1946 to now, we have seen the greatest rebirth of Jewish life in Jewish affluence, spiritually and physically, not since the times of the first temple, not, not even the second temple, which was built by, by Herod, who, who, was a, who was a psychopath. But not since the times of the first temple, uh, uh, since the times of the first temple of King Solomon, have Jews enjoyed more affluence, more influence? There is never, not, not and, and even more arguably than the time of the first temple, there has never been so much Jewish learning. Jewish, uh, the technologies enabled Judaism to spread to all corners of the globe. Jewish outreach, right? The, 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 the Teshuvah movement, Jews coming back to their roots, like our shul. This never happened in Jewish history. Never. And the amount of Jewish money, I mean, I mean, without without saying anything, uh, you know, radically uh, radical or crass, but it's totally true. The amount of Jewish affluence is unparalleled since the time of King Solomon. So, from the darkest and most hidden of isolated times for the Jewish people, gives birth to a future, a future that is incredible, that is aspirational. And the title of the class was "The Future Is Now." And so, Rabbi Lowy said, "Here's what we should do." And here's a point that I think we could, if we if we think about it, and we really work on it and dwell on it, or maybe over Shabbat, think about it. It really, I, I thought about this all after he said it. I hung up, and this has happened a number of times after I speak to him. I usually have to like sit down and like process what he has told me, and I usually find incredible, incredible real wisdom. And I, and after he told me this, I sat down. I was like, that's incredible. If we think. If we don't look at the here and now and don't try to analyze this decision and that decision and that government and this government and that directive and this directive and that person and this person, but we think about the future, like this period of isolation, of hiddenness, of being forced into our homes, 
the Jewish history tells us that it will give birth, almost a promise, a prophecy almost, it will give birth to the greatest glory that the Jewish people have, have known. And so therefore, this period, which is certainly a period of forced hiddenness and isolation and unnatural living, will give birth, just like it did by in times of the tabernacle, just like in the war, just like in Soviet Russia, just like in many of the times of Jewish history, will give birth to an incredible, it will yield an incredible, bright, brave new world, an incredible new future. And so my, the question that I have for myself that you have to all ask yourselves also is, wow, what am I doing now then to prepare myself to accept that new future? And when he said this to me, it, it, was shook, it shook me. I was like, wow, I'm here just thinking, how do I get by today and be happy today and be balanced today and, and, and try to you know, help people today? No, no, no. I have to think, and this is a little cliche. We all try to think of ourselves like, what will I be like in five years and 10 years? You know, we try to do that little exercise, but we usually give up after a minute. But this is real because events are happening that um, that have that that are telling us something new will happen in the future. There will be a great, a brave, beautiful new world that will happen, and we have to be ready for it. So we can be ready for it, or we can totally be totally, you know, totally miss it. And so it's incumbent upon us to really look to the future and see, hey, this is going to be an incredible new future, and I have to be prepared for it. And the only way to do that is to think now, how can I prepare myself now to accept that beautiful new future when it happens, however it will look like. <clears throat> that's what Rabbi Lowy told me, and that's really what we're talking about, this aspirational quality. The future is now. Future is not in the future. The future is now, because to the extent that we prepare ourselves now is the ability, is to the extent that we will be able to accept whatever happens in the future, whatever Hashem has in store for us. This is also reflected very much in the parsha, in this week's Torah portion. The Torah starts off. The parsha starts off as saying, "God said to Moses, a very strange. The first verse is very, very strange, and more el hakohanim." Say to the priests, B'nai Aaron, the sons of Aaron, the Amartalim, and you should say to them, Lo yitamabamav, do not become impure. A, 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 a Kohen cannot become impure. So obviously, the verse doesn't make any sense. God says to Moses, Moses, tell the Kohanim, and you should tell them. All right? It's an obvious redundancy. Hashem just said, tell the Kohanim. No, tell the Kohanim, don't become impure. Why does the verse say, tell the Kohanim, the sons of Aaron, and you should tell them. What, what, why, why the repetition? So, the first Rashi, the great medieval commentary, commentator, obviously picks up on this, and he says three words, or excuse me, four words, that answer this. And he says as follows. Why does it say, say to the priest twice? Say to the priest, and you should say to the priest. Why twice? Lahaz here, here's the Hebrew, and I'll translate, Lahaz here, Kedolim al hakitanim, that you should literally warn the adults about the children. You should warn the adults about the children. That's why there's a double language. You should warn the say to the adults and also say to the children. <coughs> That's why it says that Moses Moses should tell them twice. So there's many explanations about this Rashi. Um. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a few, and they all relate to this same theme, that we have to think aspirationally of what we can be in the future. So the first, word, the first point is that the word lehazhir, lehazhir actually has a few meanings. One of them is to warn or to, to, to caution. But another meaning of the word is lehazhir is to be alacritous, to zihirut, means to be vigilant, mindful, right? It means to be careful about what may be. Tell the adults to be mindful. So if you use that translation, then the phrase comes out to last here, kidolim al haktanim, to tell the adults to be mindful for their children. Meaning the kids are watching you, adults. They're looking at you in order to know what they can be. They also have this aspirational quality. They are looking to see, hey, 
That's what I'm going to be in 15, 20 years. Okay? I'm going to be that. I have to be careful. Adults, be careful now. Be careful, which has here means to be careful. Why? Because you have to be zahi, you have to have zihirut, you have vigilance, because the children are watching you. You see how you can read the, 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 the phrase? They have this aspirational quality also that they're looking to see what they can be, very much in line with what we're talking about. So you live a lifestyle, parents who have children, to live a lifestyle that will educate your children to aspire to be what you are living like now. And if you're living a life that's not incredibly profound or not filled with Judaism, well then, that's what your children will not want also. Zahir also relates to the word light. And this is where we come to Lagba Omer. On Lagba Omer, tonight and tomorrow, is the yard site of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, on, on the day, on either the day of his death or the day before his death, revealed the Zohar. The Zohar is the principal work of Kabbalah, of Jewish mysticism. He revealed it to his students. And there's many, many, you know, many, much literature said about what happened when he revealed the Zohar. The world changed. The Zohar is the Kabbalah. It's hidden. It's meant to be hidden. But you should aspire to reach the level where you can study the Kabbalah because it means that you've reached a certain perfection. And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is saying, listen, the Zohar has not been, re- this Kabbalah has not been revealed up until I'm revealing it. Because the world was not ready to it. But the world should want it. We sh- they should want to get to that place. Okay? And it speaks to that aspirational quality. There's a problem, though, in that, you know, this, um, this injunction that God says to Moses, tell the Kohanim and tell them, which we're defining as that the adults should be careful and vigilant on behalf of the minors, of the young ones. So this phrase is not found by any other mitzvah in the Torah. We don't find by the mitzvah to, to fast on Yom Kippur. Say to the code, say to the Jewish people, and say to the Jewish people, why? To teach us that the adults should be careful and show the, show the young ones that you should fast on Yom Kippur so that they're going to want to fast when they're older to fast on Yom Kippur. This phrase is not found anywhere else. It's only found here. Why? And the answer is, by other mitzvot, if your friend goes uh, to your, if your child goes to his friend's house on Yom Kippur, he'll see his friend's parents not eating and they're fasting on Yom Kippur, hopefully, okay? If he goes to, you know, his, his friend's parents' house and they keep kosher, so he sees them keeping kosher. Many mitzvot you can easily glean by osmosis from many other people in your community. However, role modeling what you kind of person, what kind of attitude, what kind of identity you want to take on in the future in your life, that only comes from the parents. And that's best represented by the Kohen, as I said at the beginning. And so it all really ties together very beautifully. I heard a lot of these ideas from different teachers of mine and from Rabbi, uh, and some of these ideas I really was able to extract from uh, some of the beautiful writing of Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg in Boca Raton, Florida, who's a wonderful, wonderful Talmud Chacham and scholar, right? Those mitzvot are very much equal across the board. Like you keep kosher, you keep kosher. You know, I mean, you know, uh, kosher style is not kosher for the record. Kosher style is, you know, just because something is called Kiva's Deli does not mean that it's kosher because some guy named Kiva put his name on on the store. By the way, uh, fun trivia fact, you would be surprised that I actually do go, do get questions asking, is Kiva's Deli kosher? I said, no, it's not. And if it was a Jewish guy, it would be Akiva probably. Kiva is not a normal nickname. Kivi, it would be Kivi's Deli. Then that would be a very good question. Okay. Zahir, cautious Zahir means vigilant, aspirational quality. Related to the word Zohar, Kivas is not a deli. I'm so sorry. Maybe that's why I don't get that. Don't get asked that anymore. <coughs> Zohar means the light, and the book is called the Zohar. Zohar means the light. It's an the Aramaic word means the light. And that's what the book was called, the Book of Light. 
Lag Ba'omer was when Rabbi Shobar Bar Yochai died, but as he died, he gave us this gift of Kabbalah, and he and he taught us that look, there's the sky is the limit with as as a Jew, you can reach the highest heights. You thought that the written law and the oral tradition was what there is. Look what I'm revealing to you. I mean, it's part of the oral tradition, the Kabbalah, the Jewish mysticism, but but there is so much more that you can be. And here it is, my my students. Here is the Zohar. In sum, we have to really believe that there will be a beautiful, glorious future for the entire Jewish people, even with this in isolation, in, even with this sadness that we're experiencing, even with this tragedy that happened tonight. But these kind of episodes being forced, it's been not, not persecution in general. That's been that's a that's been the Jewish people's you know reality from day one. But specifically, the reality of being forced into hiddenness will yield the greatest glory of the Jewish people. It happened after 45, it after, happened after the cold, the Iron Curtain fell, it happened after the Kohanim went into forced isolation. So if we wanna know what that beautiful future, then we gotta take a playbook out of this week's Parsha, out of the Kohen. And this like he represents the absolute ultimate that someone can achieve in terms of connecting to God, not because they're intrinsically holy, like Ramosha the milkman said, but because they represent, they're a dugma, they're an example that Hashem places in the world, that we can aspire and we should aspire to be like that person. So the answer is to attach yourself to people who teach you and motivate you to reach those aspirational qualities that you really, really want to be, right? The, the, the amount of time, I, I, I find it so humorous that intelligent people in the public sphere and in the political sphere, they keep on quoting Bill Gates. Bill Gates has said that the world will return to normal by the end of 2022. I'm thinking, like, what? Well, okay, and 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 they're and like, and therefore what? Like, does he have access to some like time machine? Like, did his 80 billion dollars build him a time machine that I don't know about? Like, I don't, I don't. What, what do I? Like, just because a guy has 80 billion dollars and is obviously very bright, like, I, I it doesn't mean anything to me. Like, the, like I. Like, well, I'm not going to quote Bill Gates when I want to understand what the future holds and what it means for me as a Jew. Living with this reality of a role model will help us get us there. And I want to reference last week's talk when we talked about sanctifying God's name. And with that, I'll end. We talked about last week the mitzvah of Kiddush Hashem, sanctifying God's name. Probably the most important mitzvah of the Torah, at least in my, from my humble understanding that I talked about last week. Okay. And in this week's Torah portion, the Torah continues and mentions the mitzvah of Kiddush Hashem again. But the Torah says a very interesting word. The Torah says, V'nikdashti betoch b'nei Yisrael. What does V'nikdashti mean? V'nikdashti means that I will be sanctified amongst the Jewish people. Now, and I will be sanctified, that's a passive term. In the Hebrew, it's called the Lashon Nif'al. Right, it's it's the passive uh, form of the verb. The Torah doesn't say, "and you should sanctify." That was that was last week's Torah portion. But in this week's Torah portion, and by the way, in this week's Torah portion is actually the source for the mitzvah of sanctifying God's name. This verse of, "and I will be sanctified amongst the Jewish people." Why does the Almighty say the mitzvah in such a passive sense? Shouldn't he? Shouldn't the source of the mitzvah be in the positive, proactive sense? Why Vinikdashti passively? And the lesson is very simple and very obvious. Because you just have to sometimes just be a bench. Don't be mean. Don't be stupid. Don't be brutish. Don't be rude. When you act just like a bench and just you're not wild and you act with refinement, wherever you may be, that's making a Kiddush Hashem. That is sanctifying God's name. A person looks at you and you're filling up gas and you're acting like a mensch, and you're waiting in line, and they think, oh, okay, good, a Jew acts nicely. That is a sanctification of God's name. That is the first step to sanctifying God's name. Don't be a mishugana. Don't be crazy. Be humble. Be bashful. That is one of the, the qualities of the Jewish people, according to the Talmud, are that we are merciful, we are bashful. These, these are direct, a direct quote from the Talmud. We are rachmanim, we are merciful people. We are bashanim. We're merciful unless you like soccer or the Philadelphia Flyers, and there is no mercy. And we are gomle chasadim. We are people who love 
kindness. We love doing kind deeds, which our community really embodies in a very real, real way. So we're, we're, we're bashful. Be, be a mensch. Just be a mensch. And if you act like a mensch, your children will look at you and they will say, that's what I want to be growing up. Even if they don't understand that they have a choice, like they don't, they don't understand the ability to make that decision. We have to understand that the future holds something incredible. And it's a promise from Torah based on Jewish history, as I said from Rabbi, Rabbi Loi. Let me sum up. There is a promise from Torah that some, the, this current situation will yield something incredible and profound and glorious for the Jewish people. That is a promise from the Torah, as evidenced by the priests who are went into isolation, by the warriors, by Soviet Jewry, and many other examples that I don't, I don't have time to say now. The future is now. We have to really think about not how do we get through the day, the kids are home. Try to remove yourself from those those issues, which are which are which are challenges. I mean, like trust me, like I am not uh, removing the issues. I'm not absolving the issues, but instead think about the future, and that will motivate you to think about what can I do now to prepare myself for that future. That is an incredible paradigm shift. I really and it really struck me. Maybe it'll help you. And that's represented in this week's Torah portion and these all these Torah portions by the Kohen, the priest who teaches us that, hey, this is the f- person represents something. He is the example of what I aspire to be, someone who is so connected that he is able to talk to the Almighty, the holiest day of the year and the holiest place on earth. As Ramosha, the milkman, said, and that's why that's why the Rashi says his comment only here, that you should warn the adults for the children, which means that you should t- make sure the adults understand. If you want to be aspirational and you want to represent that, Warn the adults, warn them to be vigilant because the minors are watching. And we have to watch ourselves and our children. We have to understand that our children are watching us. Even if they're older and grown out of the house, they're still watching us. The first step is v'nikdashti betoch b'nei Israel. I will be sanctified amongst the Jewish people. Just be a mensch. It's said in the passive. And finally, finally, everyone should really take to heart that, hey, tonight is Lag Ba'omer. I, uh, my wife and I didn't have a lot of time today. We dropped off so far around 20 um, um, uh, Lag Bomer loot bags. Um, some of you are here, I see, got it. If you did not get it yet, uh, Dr. Abtan, please go to your front door and get one. Uh, if you did not get it yet, don't worry. It's not that you're not popular. I mean, you probably are, but you will get it tomorrow. God willing, we just ran out of time tonight. Uh, hi, Mr. Bender, welcome to the, to the class. Nice to see you. Uh, thank you for your first comment of the evening. You will get your loot bag tomorrow, God willing. If you would, if you would live in Thornhill Woods, you would have gotten it tonight. I'm just saying, uh, Levines, you'll get, your, you'll get yours tomorrow. Just we we were only able to get to like kind of the uh, southern southern side of Thornhill Woods t- this evening. So Lag Omer, there's a, is a beautiful beautiful evening. Oh, the Levines got it. Oh, I guess my wife did more without me. Okay, lovely. Lag Bomer is a very intensely spiritual, powerful day. It represents the, all that a Jew can be. The Zohar, the light, the Jewish mysticism was given to us, and that represents that the sky is the limit for any Jew. The story of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in the cave of Meron is incredible. Look it up online. We don't have any more time. There's a song that's sung about Bar Yochai that I included in the loot bag, and there's a whole commentary in the back of that card about Lag Bomer. Please read it. It's a fascinating day, incredibly mystical, deep, beautiful day. My fondest memory, one of my fondest memories of living in Israel are the bonfires that we attended and we would sing around the bonfire and say words of Torah. It was incredible. And the fire also, fire is light, clarity. It helps you see what you want to be. God willing, in the future, we should all um, think about today what we want to be in the future. Learn the lessons of Lag Bomer and Rav Shemar Yochai. Let's end by appropriately, I think, saying one chapter of Tehillim, of Psalms, uh, in memory of those who passed away in this really horrific event in Israel, and as a merit for those who are uh, in critical condition still, and that everyone should have a refuah shalema, complete healing from this event and from any sickness that may happen. I will just say it in Hebrew, and you can repeat after me, or... Um, Think about the words. I'm not going to translate. I'll just say it in Hebrew. Uh, Dave, sh- uh, 121, I think. Shir Lamalas, Yeah, thank you. 
Um, everyone recognizes this one. It's a very well known one. You can read it in English. Why well, say the Hebrew or say it in Hebrew with me? And again, let's have in mind the victims and their and their families and those who need a complete healing. Psalm one twenty one. Shir la malo tesoi na'ya leharim emayayin yivo ezri ezri meyim adonai yoseh shemayim va'aretz al yitain lamot raglacha al yanuam shomeracha kinei lo yinim below yishana shomer Yisrael adonai shomeracha adonai tolcha al yadim minacha yom amasham mashal yakeka. The last two lines translate, the Lord will guard you from all harm. He will guard your life. Hashem will guard your going and coming now and forever. Amen. Let's do one more. Psalm 130. Um, couple of Hashtabagla <laughs> The Almighty grant them a healing soon and in our times. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Have a great Shabbos. And remember, the future is now. What am I going to be like now to accept this beautiful future that Hashem has in store for us? Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for listening. And we shall only have simchas.